Hi there, folks. My name is Elliot Kimmel. I'm a teacher at Central Secondary School in London, Ontario, and this is a tutorial for grade 12 biology students studying photosynthesis. This is not going to be um, an exciting tutorial with a lot of animations or anything like that. Uh, this is just a quick review for students that are preparing for a test and to go back over what we talked about in class for the light and dark reactions. All right, so here we go. And by the way, all these images are taken from the Nelson Biology 12 textbook, so they're not my images. So here's a chloroplast, and this region right here, that's going to be the stroma. That's going to be for the next section, the, the dark reactions, or the light independent reactions. Uh, but this right here, that's called a granum right there. And one of these little discs is a thylakoid. And as you can see, there is a stack of these thylakoids that makes up a granum. All right, so let's have a look at the light reactions. Uh, here is a blow up of a thylakoid, and this is the thylakoid space or the thylakoid lumen on the inside. And you'll notice there are two photosystems, photosystem two and photosystem one. And the photosystem is basically the light harvesting complex, all of the uh, pigments uh, involved with absorbing photons or light, as we can see here. So there are two photosystems, photosystem two, and then over here, photosystem one with another LHC, light harvesting complex or antenna complex. So we'll just start uh, over here, and light is coming in through the leaf and into the cell, and then eventually into the chloroplast, and it's going to hit one of the thylakoids, and that's what you see there. Now, within the antenna complex are many different types of photosynthetic pigments. Some are carotenoids, chlorophyll Bs, chlorophyll A. And so imagine that as the light comes in, it hits one of these pigments here, and let's call that a carotenoid. The light is going to be absorbed by the double bond system. It's going to excite an electron to a higher energy level. That electron will then fall back down, and the pigment will release energy. That energy is going to bounce from pigment to pigment each time hitting an antenna pigment and exciting it, and then the energy is going to be released. Eventually, that energy is going to hit a single chlorophyll A molecule that will be located somewhere around there. This is the reaction center chlorophyll or the trap chlorophyll, and when it receives the energy, a couple of its electrons are going to be excited and they're not going to fall right back down to the chlorophyll. They're going to be transferred into an associated electron transport system. So we've got a photosystem and we've got an ETS uh, right beside. So as the electrons move from ETS component to ETS component, which are embedded in the thylakoid membrane, energy is released by the movement of those electrons and by the transfer of those electrons. That energy is used to take hydrogen ions that are floating around in the stroma, out here in the stroma, to take hydrogen ions and bring them into the thylakoid space. And that's done by one of the components called PQ, plastoquinone. So the hydrogen ions start to build up inside the stroma, and that's going to create a proton gradient or hydrogen ion concentration gradient. Um, hydrogen, of course, is positively charged, so it can't just simply diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer that makes up the membrane of the thylakoid. So instead, as those hydrogens build up, they start to move down through a hydrogen ion tunnel or pore called the ATPase, and that's associated with an enzyme called ATP synthase. And as the hydrogens move from high concentration inside the thylakoid to low concentration in the stroma, as they do that, they activate the enzyme ATP synthase, which will convert ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and inorganic phosphate, PI, they will come together to create ATP. So it's the movement of the hydrogens through this that caused the production of ATP. This is called photophosphorylation as opposed to substrate level phosphorylation in, say, glycolysis or oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. It's photophosphorylation because the energy originally comes from sunlight which is then um, converted into the energy that will be necessary to pump hydrogen ions, which will then create the ATP, so photophosphorylation. So the electron has been moving down the ETS of photosystem 2, and this is what created the ATP out in the stroma. Keep in mind it's going to be out there because it's going to be used in the Calvin cycle, and we'll see that in a bit. The electron eventually, or electrons, will come into photosystem 1, and in order for them to have a place to go, we're going we're to stop 
the process right there and now pick up with photosystem one imagine photons now are coming in hitting the antenna complex of photosystem one let's say chlorophyll b this time electron gets excited drops back down chlorophyll b radiates out energy to the next antenna pigment let's say it's a carotenoid and then a chlorophyll b again eventually the energy hits the single chlorophyll a molecule the trap or reaction center chlorophyll and it will release electrons to an electron acceptor, which in this case is ferrodoxin, which will then pass it on to the next uh, ETS component, the last one, which is called NADP reductase. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's called NADP reductase because an electron carrier similar to NADH or FADH2 um, in Krebs cycle, um, NADP plus is the electron carrier in this case in plants and it's going to pick up electrons from the NADP reductase so this this molecule here this component here is transferring electrons to NADP plus so it's reducing it and the reduced form is NADPH again one of the products in addition to the ATP that we need for the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle um, so when the electrons are removed from the chlorophyll A over here and travel down the ETS, there's now a space right here. All right, it's lost a couple of electrons. So electrons that were coming from photosystem 2 down the ETS now have a place to go and they uh, go back into the chlorophyll A. So this is called pigment regeneration. But over here, this chlorophyll A had lost electrons down the ETS and eventually regenerated these ones. And then, of course, these ones are kicked out. But we need to now regenerate the chlorophyll A over here, and that's where water comes in. One of the main reasons why plants need to be watered or receive water and conserve their water by closing stomates if it's too hot. They need the water in order to provide electrons back to the chlorophyll A in photosystem 2. So there is a um, water splitting enzyme here called Z or a Z prote protein and it performs photolysis which is the splitting of water and that's going to yield electrons up to here. It's going to create some hydrogen right from the splitting of water. Those hydrogens can be used in the proton gradient to help produce ATP and it's also going to create some oxygen and this is the oxygen that will then diffuse out of the chloroplast and eventually be released from the plant and creates the oxygen in the atmosphere. All right, so that's a summary of the light reactions. Now, let's move on to the dark reactions. Um, the dark reactions occur in the stroma of the chloroplast. So whereas the light reactions were over here in the thylakoid and the ATP and the NADPH were produced here, all right, out in the stroma, those are then going to go over and be used in the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle. And here we see the Calvin cycle right here. Um, it's also referred to as the C3 cycle because the first organic molecule that will contain carbon dioxide is this one right here. All right, it's a three carbon molecule of phosphoglycerate. So this is called the C3 cycle. All right, so here's CO2. And the idea is um, CO2 is entering the plant through the stomates in the bottom of the leaf, usually in the bottom. And CO2 is a gas, and so you can't, you know, grab a gas with your hands and try to hold on to it, and neither can the leaf. So we need to fix this carbon dioxide into a molecule so that it will stay in the plant. So the first phase is called carbon fixation. Carbon dioxide will enter through the stomates and go into the, into the chloroplast, into the stroma, and waiting there in the stroma is this molecule here, RUBP, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. There are two phosphate groups on here, so it's called a bisphosphate, and the abbreviation is RUBP. RUBP is considered the acceptor molecule, sort of analogous to the oxaloacetate of Krebs cycle, and this thing in red is an enzyme, Rubisco. And it is the enzyme that will take carbon dioxide and click it onto the acceptor molecule. So these two things are going to collide. The enzyme is going to assist in the reaction. And that is going to create our first product of the dark reactions or the light independent reactions. Um, what I like to do is to keep track of the carbons here. So if three carbon dioxides were to come in, you're going to have three carbons. Sorry about my bad writing. And this is five carbons, so you're going to have 15 carbons. I can't write that. I should just use my text afterwards. 15 carbons here, so you're going to have a total of 18 carbons right here. So just keep track of the of the carbons because we've got six 
molecules of three carbons each, so 18 carbons. So we haven't lost any carbons or anything like that. All right, so let's move on. This molecule here, which you saw in glycolysis, is just floating in the cytoplasm, in the stroma, sorry, and it is going to encounter ATP. This is the ATP that came from the light reactions, and this is the NADPH from the light reactions. So with the input of energy and a phosphate group, so some kind of a phosphorylation, you can see this has one phosphate, one three bisphosphoglycerate has two, so it's gained a phosphate, and then there's going to be some reductions, loss of phosphates, etc. So we're going to lose some phosphate to come down to here. So it's gone from that region there. Though so we add some hydrogen, some electrons, that kind of thing. We convert this into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Notice how this is the reverse of glycolysis. And that's an interesting, an interesting feature there. If we have six of these three carbon molecules, one of them will come off of the cycle and the other five will continue to go around and with some conversions will go back to the acceptor molecule, RUBP, which is ready to take more carbon dioxide and continue the cycle going. So we now have one G3P down here. That's just three carbons with a phosphate group. Now that's not enough to make a six carbon molecule here, or certainly not enough to make one of these larger molecules like this polymer. So this has to happen twice two times. The whole cycle is going to have to happen twice if we're taking three CO2s at a time so that two of these molecules will come down here. So one in a turn and then another turn to give us two of these, two three carbon molecules now gives us enough to make our glucose molecule and we're all set. And of course two of these coming together um, makes six carbons in total and that's why six CO2s is one of the um, one of the reactants in the entire photosynthesis equation of 6CO2 and water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right, so that's the light independent reactions, which doesn't directly require light, but still requires the products of the light reactions in order to produce the carbohydrate that it will eventually make. And of course, other than glucose, starch can be made, sucrose, and you can see here the G3P can go off to make the glucose initially. That can make sucrose. Um, all of this can go into cell respiration because plants do need to do this. It can make cellulose for its cell walls. Uh, it can store it as starch, etc. All right, so hope that helps. See you next time.